Right. Thank you all for having me here. Uh, my name is Laura Fitton. I am called pistachio to my face more often than I am called Laura to my face. That's because of my Twitter handle. Um, and this is a snapshot of kind of where I am today. I was the sole founder of a company called 140. It was originally going to be an app store for Twitter. Twitter made certain decisions about how it was going to handle its ecosystem, so we pivoted. Um, and we were acquired by HubSpot in August 2011. I am the author of Twitter for Dummies. Um, I do have a ridiculous number of people reading my tweets. It's a little weird. This is who I was five years ago, completely disconnected, didn't even really know what Web 2.0 was. Um, so the reason I sort of start with a little bit of a personal angle on this is to help you understand the magnitude and power of the types of things we're going to be talking about. Because they made a very rapid change. That was May 2007. And all the stuff, all the hype and craziness going on on this slide uh, was already happening within just a few months of May 2007. Uh, this article ran in April 2008. This is upside down, sorry, but I lectured at Harvard Business School about Twitter for Business in April 2009. That's probably the latest event here. August 2007, a guy named Guy Kawasaki, who was like this idol of mine, that I read his stuff and I loved it, they called me on the phone and said, all right, fine, explain this Twitter thing for me. And I had no idea I was going to be in Seth Godin's book until it was published. It was a complete shock. Um, Within two years of that, two and a half years of that May 2007 period, I got an idea for a startup and fought like hell not to do it. Uh, failed at quitting my startup and therefore became the founder and CEO of 140.com. We raised about $2.4 million. Um, you know, raising is not winning. But it, we had a very interesting run and there had been very kind, ridiculous hype about me. How the heck did all that happen? How did I go from completely disconnected, not knowing what Web 2.0 was? Uh, I did have some internet and media savvy. Media savvy. I'd been a marketing consultant for 14 years. I had looked at internet as the cable industry died uh, back when I was working at a cable startup. Um, but the big picture thing of what happened are two things, Twitter and inbound marketing. We're going to speak about both today. Um, I started 140 with a very simple thesis, and by connecting to the torrent of data, of ideas, of information, of connections, of humans that is flying through Twitter every day, um, and this was years ago when there was no less of it, that software that could interact with that was going to change the world. And in fact, it already has, as we can look at a bunch of different political events, sporting events, I challenge you to sit in a bar and watch television without seeing Twitter somewhere. Uh, that was all unheard of in 2007 when I started sort of going, hey, there's this thing. I'm going to go through three main things I want you to know. Now, when I do this as an hour-long keynote, I go through the 12 sub-things of the three things, but I'm going to keep it very high level, fly through quickly, and just basically assess for you, or establish for you guys what the heck is it. Um, how, do you, how do you be good at it? What is it? How do you do it? And what's next? What's coming down the road? Right? So the basic conceptual what that I hope will resonate with a more serious business audience are to think of Twitter as, sorry, it's gotten a little cut off, an EKG for attention. These are some stats from during the Olympics. Not only is Usain Bolt the fastest man in the world, peaking at 27.78 miles per hour when he runs, uh, he was also the fastest athlete on Twitter, peaking at 80,000 tweets per minute, which is a you know kind of quick and dirty stat they use to see when a certain idea, event, person, zeitgeist is starting to really spike and trend on Twitter. Incidentally, that was not the highest TPM during the whole Olympics. The highest was 140,000. It was the Spice Girls, I believe, during the closing ceremony. <laughs> so things that people either love or hate or both tend to do quite well on Twitter. Um, one of the other things that's extraordinary, like if you remember two things about Twitter. One is, you know, the, the software that can read it and pick up actual signal in the mess is uh, we've just dipped our toes in. There's going to be some amazing things coming. The other is that it really subverts this influencer model that we are still carrying with us 
from the one to many mass media days. Um, people still look at accounts like mine that have a lot of followers and they think that's special and I can do something with that, I can push something out there. I cannot. You cannot push rope. What's really interesting is that in this mean media more than any other, the message itself is the influencer. So this photograph that I'm sure all of you have seen before today and saw within moments of it being taken, um, that guy had 147 followers at the time. He was not an influencer. He just got his hands on an incredibly influential piece of content. In fact, it wasn't his followers that picked it up and relayed it and retweeted it and propagated it out to the rest of the network. It was an individual in an office tower in Manhattan looking at the river going, you know, oh my god, there's a lake in the river. Uh, I'm trying to get clean for some other audiences. Um, you don't have to. Okay, holy fucking shit. <laughs> um, so, hi everybody on video. <laughs> <laughs> and his first thought was, I bet there's something on Twitter about that. Which again, this was quite a long time ago. Twitter wasn't nearly as big as we're talking now. And sure enough, he went to Twitter search, very quickly found the plane, started sending that out to his contacts. And the photographer was an internationally published photojournalist before he even got off the ferry. Twitter means that 5 billion people in the world, right now, with existing technologies, by the way, this has been the case for five years, people just didn't know it, could send four text messages and put up a website. I mean, a page, right? A URL, uniquely findable, go back and figure it out later, page on the web. Many to many, no way to have predicted that. And when five billion people can be nationally, internationally, findably published, in a moment's blink, you know, that means you really kind of mean everybody. And when you think about the societal and economic and um, business changes brought on by technologies like the printing press, like the telegraph, right, how significant they were in their time, just try and think ahead to what it means that five billion people can now publish, okay? So the hows. The question, there's kind of the outline of the section, be useful, tame the fox, and maintain loose ties. The question I get the most, that drives me the most batshit crazy, is this. <laughs> and it's, it's a universal human need, and god damn, I wish they would take that number and put it sort of further back into the software, so it wasn't quite as obvious. People are so hung up on the number of followers, and it really, it really doesn't matter, because you don't want a, a following you want really engaged fan base, right? Now, of course, they're not going to rock concert and scream and rave about you know, janitorial services or ball bearings or being able to know before their machine breaks down. But you want the functional equivalent of that, right? The people who really get the value you bring matters much more than a raw number. The quick and easy way, and this is we have a nice long section on inbound marketing, I'm going to fly through these next couple things. The quick and easy way to do well at Twitter and anything we're going to talk about today, simply make yourself useful. Simply do something of value. Either write something worth reading or do something worth writing about. Who the heck knew Ben Franklin was an inbound marketing and social media consultant? But he was, and he nailed it, and he's absolutely right. Chips. It used to be about the soapbox, <coughs> buy your way in, interrupt people, demand their attention. Now you can gain incredible influence, and even my personal story is an example of this, by providing attention and providing value to others. You have to remember that anything you do with these tools, with your marketing, with getting yourself out there, is just no longer about you. It needs to be flipped around way more about their needs and interests and values than it is about yours. Marketing. Not quite sure how to do that or what to write about or what to put out there in your marketing materials? Very simple formulation of it from my friend Ann Hanley up in New Hampshire. She is a marketing prof. She writes their Twitter account that she's also kind of the heart and soul of the company. If you don't know what to write about, write about your customers. Write about their hero stories. Write about how their businesses are more effective, their lives are better, 
they're better able to serve, they have more leverage, whatever it is that you bring as your value, the stories you want to be telling are the stories that make your customers look like heroes. The four-word version of Twitter marketing, rather than just be useful, two-word version, is to listen, to learn from what you're hearing, to genuinely care, and to try to serve. Again, I'm not going to dig way the heck into that, because we're going quickly through this part, but the just you know, social media monitoring tools, you can pick up all kinds of interesting signal about your customers, about your industry, <coughs> have a good listening strategy. Learn from what you're hearing. Don't just, okay, I heard that and I've never changed a thing. Care when you attempt to do something about things. Go back to that question that everybody asks. I know, even though I've sort of told you it doesn't matter, at some level you may still care. If you want to build your following, take amazing care of the followers you already have. Have you followed them back? Are you talking to them? Are you reading some of their tweets and retweeting them when they put up something useful and relevant that you think your readers are going to like too? Right? So many people focus on, let me go get new, go get new, go get new, neglecting their existing base. Now, my Twitter account's an edge case, but I do get people showing up out of nowhere and I don't realize they're the CTO of Cisco until they suddenly start talking to me and we have this relationship, right? I don't know that they are a uh, amazing VC with DFJ who used to be the CEO of AOL. You know, it's just you don't necessarily know who's there. Don't take your existing followers for granted and think, ah, whatever, I don't care about them, I want to get new ones. Because it is in engaging with the ones you have that they talk back to you and new people see you. They all have audiences that don't know you yet. If you're interacting and engaging with them, they're going to start telling your audiences about you and your solutions and your business. Hashtags are Times Square. That valuable real estate, those expensive billboards, that marketing craziness, that advertising craziness is there because millions of people go through it. A hashtag on a message that's going to become the influencer becomes for a moment or for years, depending on the hashtag, just like a little piece of real estate, a little piece of Times Square. It's fascinating to see what can happen. So again, it's something I want you to keep an open mind on. Um, if we had more time on the Twitter segment, I could kind of drill down to like how you tactically, specifically could use hashtags in your business. Uh, one way is to ask questions and say, all right, answer this with a hashtag. And all it does is it lets everybody watching all see the same stream of answers. Because there's a search you know, component. You click. So, so a hashtag is simply a pound sign and any string of letters you want. Twitter is now engineered, so that will become a link to a search of every other instance on Twitter of that particular string of characters. Right? So I might say, hey, I want to talk about inbound marketing on Twitter. And I would ask a question, I would say, tag your answer, you know, I-N-M-K-G or something, inbound marketing. And the entire group, it would be like building a website around that topic. The entire group who's following that can all see each other's tweets and engage in a conversation. Let's shift now to marketing and inbound and what it really means. We, uh, this is a slide we built this summer for our conference. Um, marketing is a pretty serious lovability problem. In fact, we found some data that showed that stockbrokers and lawyers are considered more trustworthy and lovable than marketers. Fortunately, we did beat out lobbyists and car sales. <laughs> it was a close, it was a close thing. So how do we fix this? How do we build trust and actually make marketing something really useful that can run businesses and grow businesses? Well, we think the way is actually quite simple. We challenge people to stop creating marketing that's annoying and only create marketing that people actually love. You want to generate this kind of feeling in the person you're trying to get to with your stuff, in the person you're trying to get to eventually buy your products, buy your services, realize that you have a great advantage over your competition. So instead of pushing people through your funnel and forcing leads through the decision process you've decided is the most important for your prospective buyer, you need to start attracting, and this actually should say customers, not consumers, I apologize. Start attracting customers by being relevant. <coughs> by being useful. There's my two-word guide to Twitter, right? Be useful. 
by having really easy to find content at their time of need for that type of content, right? So, so you want to attract the right customers. You want to see what they're interested in. You want to be able to grade and score the lead on, on how ready they might be to buy. And you want to start working with how they make their purchasing decisions and whom they need to win over at their organization to get the invoice signed, right? <clears throat> the old way, you know, push your messages out, pay for access to audiences, rent, this thing we'll talk about in a minute, but when you buy an email list, you're really just kind of renting that email list because it's going to just decay over time. When you buy Google AdWords to generate a bunch of traffic, you don't own that traffic, you're renting that traffic. The moment you stop paying rent, bye bye, it's gone. Interrupting people, um, really pushing ad inventory at them, to owning your own media, earning your own media, pulling people in, attracting them, and building an asset over time. Getting into inbound marketing and, and how it works and what it is. The two biggest pieces of it, we have, we have a lot of different, you know, we have one where we say like, get found and then convert and then analyze everything. Probably the two biggest concepts to understand about doing inbound marketing right is, you know, you've heard of content marketing, that's a hugely important piece of inbound marketing. But inbound is more than just content, it's context too. And I'm going to drill down a little bit into how that could look for you. So let's take the content piece first. And the content can be on your site, in your blog, that's a little RSS signal. It could be links that you're sharing, it could be your presence on Google+, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever social networks you're engaging on. In these materials, and I kind of hinted at this one before, right? Are you renting your marketing? Or is it yours? Do you own it? Are you going to have it forever? Um, like I said, blog leads, 70% of the new leads we get every month on our blog are from old legacy articles, from old legacy inbound links, from old legacy press coverage. There was a silly piece on, on Mashable.com last summer about me as a, as a female founder, right? We've actually gotten customers at HubSpot because of that. So the, the fact that it's out there, you've built that asset, and let's talk about what some of those assets are and what the most important thing you need to do, whichever one you build. You don't have to do all of them. You, you don't necessarily have the capacity to do all of them. It's not necessarily like cost effective to do all of them. How many do you, what do you do? Should you do three of them? Do the things you're good at, where your audience is, and that you can maintain a high quality level. And we're going to talk about quality level in a second, right? So um, it's really less a question of there being some abstract reality of the correct number or the correct approach or the correct mix and more about the reality of where your customers are going to be and what you're going to be able to do well. Um, you know, what's the number of times a week I should update my blog? Well, my, my colleague Dan Zarella has run some wonderful number crunching and stats and found like, oh, you know, 10 times would be great, morning, afternoon, certain day parts, all that's great. But if you have one busy, strapped person who's doing their blog as, you know, a small part of their job, and updating 10 times a week means updating 10 really sucky posts, then God, no, please don't update 10 times a week. Please update once a month when you have something really, really good. So, so, so the things that make you findable on Google, um, is your content useful to humans, right? Do people click in and stay on the page a while as opposed to bounce right back? Um, is it updated frequently? Is there new content on the site? Is it content that delivers some information? All of those things, you know, we used to, for SEO, have to accomplish by adding more pages to our site. We have this great thing called blogging now. It makes it super portable and easy to keep putting out articles that are going to get found. People. So going back to that kind of content and context model, let's, let's talk about context now. <coughs> I just want to peek ahead. Okay. So, Again, there's a whole long section we can go through on like, what exactly do we mean by context? I'll tell you the quickest, most concrete example, Netflix or Amazon. Anybody use either or both of those, no. right? So you log in and you go, and the Amazon you see and you see and you see looks nothing like the Amazon I see. Because they know what I've bought before and they're working within my context. So this idea that, um, yeah, one feature we're doing this summer was like smart buttons, right? Your call to action buttons on your website. 
right now or you know, before that software was able to do it, everybody saw the same button. You know, sign up, buy now, inquire, have a salesperson call. The idea that you can create buttons that, oh, this person who just came to my site, yeah, I've never ever seen that person before, so I'm going to give them the brand new person offer. As opposed to your 12-year customer comes to your site, they see a different call to action because they don't want to see your software demo. They've been your customer for 12 years. They don't need the demo. They need support. Right? So what if your site was intelligent enough to recombinate itself on the fly to provide that kind of context? So the kind of review of it is this idea that you know your content, whatever pieces you're doing, whatever marketing assets, maybe it's photos, videos, Maybe it's social media offers are you know, this idea of ebooks and infographics and other things that you offer out to the market for the small price of someone give me your email address and fill out a form to get it. Um, but if it's a really, really relevant targeted offer, then those leads that you get as a result, your salespeople are going to be able to say, like, hey, you know, noticed you were looking at that offer on inbound marketing. Can I answer any questions on the ebook or did you show it to your boss and, and do you have any questions on how to implement the stuff that's in that ebook? Right? That's where your content can jump to your contacts. Um, you want to be using tools that give you a good view of who your contacts are, what they're doing on social media, how they got to you, you know, whatever CRM system you use. You want to segment out your emails. That's the uh, you know, dishwasher email going to the dishwasher guy, the fridge email going to the fridge guy. Or since you know, actually, dishwasher and fridge is a bad example because people redoing their kitchen are probably buying both at once. But if you are going to send fridge person a dishwasher offer, you probably want to send them the Gen Air bundle where, oh, you're buying a fridge, you get a, a dishwasher, a microwave, and a stove for only $300 more. And look how much money you've saved, right? And you want the, the website to be able to personalize. You know, it would be great. So how are you doing? 